My hour has not yet come. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. A wise but anonymous writer once penned, Plan ahead. It was not raining when Noah built the ark. Likewise, the following item appeared in the April 5th, 1993 edition of the Christian magazine, Today in the Word. Noted British sculptor Sir Jacob Epstein was once visited in his studio by the eminent author and fellow Briton George Bernard Shaw, who noticed a huge block of stone standing in one corner and asked what it was for. Epstein shook his head and answered, I don't know yet, I'm still making plans. Shaw was astounded. You mean you plan your work? Why, I change my mind several times a day. That's all very well with a four-ounce manuscript, replied Epstein, but not with a four-ton block. I invite everyone here today to try to understand something very important. Granted, it may take a copious amount of mental gymnastics to accomplish, but I do urge each one of us to try to wrap our gray matter around this one simple fact. Nearly everything that our Lord Jesus Christ experienced during his lifetime on earth occurred on purpose. Once again, that's nearly everything that our Lord Jesus Christ experienced during his lifetime on earth occurred on purpose. That means there were few accidents, few coincidences. In other words, precious little happened to Jesus that had not been foreseen since the very beginning, since the creation of the universe, if you will. Virtually every detail, every minute, every second of the estimated 33 years that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ spent on this planet had been worked out with his heavenly father well in advance of his arrival as a baby in Bethlehem's stable. In fact, even before sin entered the Garden of Eden, the shadow of the cross had already appeared on the horizon. Bearing all this in mind, what follows borrows a great deal and with much gratitude from what Max Lucado speculates on pages 136 to 141 of his 1993 book, He Still Moves Stones. In short, Jesus came with a well-designed plan. And we can tell by some of the phrases that he used while here on earth, like St. John chapter 7, verse 6, for instance, where Jesus says, the right time for me has not yet come. Or how about St. Matthew chapter 26, verse 18, the chosen time is near. Or St. John chapter 12, verse 23, the time has come for the Son of Man to receive his glory. Or St. Mark chapter 14, verse 41, the time has come for the Son of Man to be handed over to sinful people. Or St. John chapter 17, verse 1, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Now, let's ponder for a moment these particular words. The right time has not yet come. The chosen time is near. The time has come. Now, what exactly do these phrases imply? How about this? A schedule. They represent a definite order of events. In a word, the earthly mission of Jesus Christ was planned, period. And just as there was a plan for Jesus' ministry, there would be a first miracle that Jesus would perform. And its plot, as described in today's gospel lesson from St. John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, is almost too simplistic. As the beloved disciple notes, Jesus and his disciples are invited guests at a wedding in the small Galilean village of Cana, during which the wedding feast host runs out of wine. So Jesus, at his mother Mary's urging, transforms six jugs of water into six jugs of wine. That's it. That's the lead-off hitter, so to speak. Kind of low-key, don't you think? I mean, it certainly doesn't have the impact of raising a person from the dead or, or the flair of straightening a crippled leg or the pizzazz of healing the deaf or the blind. Or does it? 
Perhaps there is more to this first miracle than we first think. You see, a wedding in Jesus' day was no small event. It usually began with a sundown ceremony at the local synagogue. Then the wedding party and the invited guests would, ha would leave the synagogue and begin a long procession through the town, winding their way in the soft evening sunlight up and down the city streets. The newly married couple would then be escorted past as many homes as possible so that everyone in the town or village could wish them well. However, following the procession, the married couple did not go on a honeymoon. Instead, in a sense, the honeymoon was brought to them in that they would go home to a huge party. For several days or as much as a week even, there would be gift giving and speech making and food eating and of course, wine drinking, lots of wine drinking. In ancient Near East society in general, and in the Jewish culture in particular, food and wine at a wedding feast were taken very seriously. With the host of the wedding feast honoring the guests by keeping their plates full and their cups overflowing. Conversely, it was considered a gross insult to the guests if the host ran out of either food or wine. Hospitality at a wedding, you see, was regarded as a sacred duty. So serious were these social customs, in fact, that if they were not observed, actual lawsuits could be brought by the injured parties. Even the Jewish rabbis universally held that without wine, there is no joy. Hence, wine was crucial not for drunkenness, which was considered a disgrace, but for what it demonstrated. You see, the presence of wine affirmed that this was a special day and that all the wedding guests were special guests. In contrast, the absence of wine was seen as much more than a minor faux pas. Indeed, it was a social embarrassment bordering on a catastrophe. In verse 2 of today's Gospel lesson from St. John chapter 2, Jesus' mother Mary is one of the first people to notice that the wine has run out. So she goes immediately to her son Jesus and points out the problem to him, saying in verse 3, they have no more wine. Only to hear Jesus' rather terse response in verse 4, dear woman, why come to me? My time has not yet come. There are those words again, my time. Jesus, you see, is keenly aware of the plan. He already has a time and a place selected for his first miracle, and this, frankly, is not it. To repeat, Jesus knows the plan. Furthermore, Jesus has spent all of recorded time, that is, until this precise moment during a wedding feast in the middle of nowhere, Cana of Galilee, preparing to fulfill the plan. And at first it appears that Jesus is going to stick with the plan. But as he hears the pleading in his mother's voice and looks into the faces of the members of the wedding party, Jesus suddenly, wait for it, Jesus reconsiders. The significance of the eternal plan is slowly eclipsed by Jesus' concern for the people. Mark this down. To our Lord, timing is important, but people, well, they are much more so. And as a result, Jesus changes the plan to meet the needs of some friends. Incredible. Heaven's eternal schedule is altered, so some friends will not suffer embarrassment. Jesus Christ's inaugural miracle is motivated not by tragedy or by famine or by moral collapse, but by his concern for some friends who are in a bind. Now, Jesus' apparent knee-jerk reaction might have come as quite a shock, perhaps even as a great disappointment to all the angels and archangels in heaven who, by the way, were no doubt as familiar with the original timeless plan as were God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. However, if you are a human being who has ever been embarrassed, you like Jesus' choice very much. Why? 
because Jesus' first miracle tells us in no uncertain terms that what matters to us matters to God. Now, granted, we all probably agree with this particular statement when it comes to the big stuff, that is. Certainly when it comes to major league difficulties like sin and disease and disaster and death, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God cares. But what about the smaller, less crucial things? What about grouchy bosses or flat tires or lost pets? What about broken dishes or late flights or toothaches or crashed hard drives? Do these minor annoyances even matter to Almighty God? I mean, after all, he's got a universe to run. He's got the stars and the planets to keep in balance and countries and world leaders to watch over. He's got wars to deal with and fa famines to fix. So just who are we to tell him about broken fingernails or about bulging waistlines or about getting royally soaked while waiting for the bath. Well, how's this for starters? We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. What is more, we were chosen before the creation of the world, as St. Paul most confidently assures us in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, and Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, respectively. Or as Moses himself confirms in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 19, we are destined for praise, fame, and honor, and we will be holy people to the Lord our God. But even more than any of these, and more significant than any title or position, is the simple fact that we are God's children. As St. John reminds us in his first general epistle, chapter 3, verse 1, the Father has loved us so much that we are called children of God, and we really are his children. You know, I absolutely love that last phrase, we really are are his children. It's as if St. John knew that some of us would shake our heads and say, no, nah, not me. Mother Teresa, maybe. Billy Graham, all right, but certainly not me. If that is truly how some of us feel, then St. John added that phrase specifically for us to mark, learn, and inwardly digest. We really are his children. As a result, if something is important to any of us, it is important to our Heavenly Father. End of statement. Still finding it hard to believe? Well, try to imagine for a moment being a parent, and you happen to notice an infected sore on the hand of your seven-year-old daughter. You ask her what's wrong and are told that she has a splinter. You then ask her when it happened. And she says, get this, last week. Incredulous, you ask why she didn't tell you. And you are told, I didn't want to bother you. I knew you had all those things to do running the household and all, and I, I didn't want to get in your way. Dumbfounded, you managed to stammer something like, get in my way? Get in my way? I, I'm your parent. You're my daughter. My job is to help you. For when you hurt... I heard. In the exact same way, because we are God's children, if it is important to us, then it's important to God. I began today's message by using phrases like nearly everything, few accidents, few coincidences, and precious little to describe the minor exceptions to the rule of the precise heavenly plan for Jesus' time on earth. So I need to ask, why did Jesus change the water into wine? Was it to impress the wedding guests? No, they didn't even realize that he'd done it. Then was it to get the wedding host's attention? No, he thought that the groom was simply being overly generous. So why on earth did Jesus do it? 
I remember my first diocesan bishop in the Anglican Catholic Church of Canada, the same man, by the way, who made me a deacon and eventually ordained me as a priest in the Church of God, the Right Reverend Robert W. Mercer, telling me one day of his own experience as a newly minted priest in parish ministry. As a young man, Bishop Mercer said, he was sure that the Bible was full of absolutes, that everything was either black or white, and that they were, there were absolutely no gray areas. Bishop Mercer then went on to tell me that it only took one week working at his first pastoral charge for him to completely change his mind and his heart. Because Bishop Mercer quickly found out that there were things known as extenuating circumstances, that life didn't fit very neatly into theological pigeonholes, and that to be truly Christ-like, a priest must deal with all situations on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, I definitely believe that Bishop Robert Mercer truly got the message behind Jesus' first miracle of changing water into wine at a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, that what matters to us matters to God. So again, I need to ask, why did Jesus change the water into wine? More to the point, what motivated Jesus to do it? Near as I can tell, it's because, one, his friends were embarrassed, two, what bothered them bothered him, and three, if it hurts the child, it hurts the father. That's it. Accordingly, this second Sunday after the Epiphany, let's take a page out of St. John's Gospel, specifically chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Let's go ahead and tell God what hurts us. Let's talk to him as a child would to a loving parent. And I promise our Heavenly Father won't turn us away. What's more, whether it's our version of a four-ounce manuscript or a four-ton block, God won't think it's unimportant or insignificant. For as the author to the epistle of the Hebrews promises us in chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, for our high priest is able to understand our weaknesses. When he lived on earth, he was tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. Let us then feel very sure that we can come before God's throne where there is grace. So does God care about the little things in our lives? We better believe it. If nothing else, Jesus' first and undoubtedly unplanned miracle at a wedding in middle of nowhere Cana of Galilee assures us that if it matters to us, then we can be absolutely sure that it matters to him. And we can all plan on that. Let us pray. Watch over thy children, O Heavenly Father, as our days increase. Bless and guide us wherever we may be. Strengthen us when we stand. Comfort us when we are discouraged or sorrowful. Raise us up when we fall. And in our hearts may thy peace, which passeth all understanding, abide all the days of our life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen.